My name is Stephen Prina. I'm an artist and a musician, and I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts and Los Angeles, California. If memory serves, uh, the first time that I caught a glimpse of Mike, um, I had just moved to California from Illinois, where I was born, and I was uh, enrolled at California Institute of the Arts in the graduate program. So there was a large meeting at the beginning of the fall semester, uh, kind of an orientation meeting, I think. And there was this little scrawny guy in the corner in a, um, a white tank top. And someone nudged me and said, that guy's Mike Kelly. We were brought together with a variety of other musicians at the time. He had asked me to play keyboard in one manifestation of Gobbler, which is a band he was participating in. But this, the beat of the traps, is the, um, is the work that we um, developed for the longest and, uh, and then did you know, these two um, different performances in different cities in Vienna at the Remisa and at the Gindi Auditorium. I know that I had um, attended a variety of different dance performances that Anita had made. Anita and I started talking about the possibility of collaborating on something like that, but we didn't really know what that was going to be. So Anita and I started to have meetings and talk about what we could do and certain ideas of structuring uh, either a work or an evening. We didn't have any idea what the scale of it would be at that point. Anita went home one night and she had mentioned that we had had, a, that, that Anita and I had had a meeting and we were talking about this work and Mike became very interested in it and at one point suggested that he join the group. So it made it into a trio and then it um, uh, eventuated in this uh, performance that had a d different episodes. <laughs> Well, traps, that's a drum kit. And it suggests not an isolated piece of percussion equipment. It really is the ensemble of percussion instruments that are brought together to constitute what we see on a stage when a band plays. And the beat of the traps is just the idea of a beat that is established by a drummer such as that, either a jazz drummer or a popular drummer. And it has a lot to do with a regular pulse. It establishes a beat. And of course what happens in the work is that regular pulse is um, unraveled a little bit and, and made complicated in a variety of different ways. We had two drummers playing exactly the same transcription from let's say Led Zeppelin, but they're playing one, um, they're playing out of sync with one another. And so in doing that, you're more aware of the component parts out of which popular art or popular music are made. Mike wrote the libretto for this. And I always thought of Alan as being the doppelganger for Mike. So he was the person who played the, the surrogate position of Mike. Mike had developed quite a figure in performance in Southern California from the 70s to the early 80s. And then at one moment he suspended his um, presence as a performer in, um, in, in the performances that he did. And this was a way for him to still participate in a live performative act, but um, not be present on stage. Lunatic, take your cue from moon, la la. La la, la la, demiurge, when erg, hit kit. Alan um, had a derby hat that had a, a band of green sequins. And he had a, sequin, a green sequined bow tie. And he didn't wear a shirt. And he had a green sequined vest. And he had a very expressive, elastic face. That was very important in his casting. I wore a dark gray suit with a white shirt, and I also had a green sequin bow tie. 
and I wore dark green sunglasses. You can't make contact with my eyes. The eye contact was always with Alan, the actor, hyper animated, and I was withdrawn. And so, um, we, and we wanted to play those two poles. I play a guitar solo with a handheld um, tape recorder that has a speaker, and I have the cassette tape of the number one single from Billboard, and I'm doing kind of like fast forward in play, and I'm using that as a pick, and the electric pickups are actually picking up the sound of that tape, of that single being reprocessed through the guitar. So I'd like to think that there were many times when we would kind of set up an expectation about how an instrument would be used or how a bit of choreography would be used or a bit of text would be used, and then there was this idea of turning it to see, well, how does that modify its reception? Does that change the way in which the audience would be um, taking this in? Boys in the hood. Boys there was this other component in the work that was not about nostalgia or a tasteful selection. It was as though um, the, the, the grand mass of people who listen to music and buy music were indicating what I would perform that week. So whatever was the number one single. Our performance was part of the large spring festival that they do in the arts in Vienna, which is very famous and very well attended. I know that when we performed it in Vienna, there was a lot of head scratching. We were very pleased with the results of this. And so we're interested in you know, reception and reception theory, I guess. But in some respects, it, it exceeded um, uh, what we anticipated. All three of us learned so much from working together on that project. And we're three very, very different personalities, but I think that that's what um, provided a certain kind of combustible aspect to this. And we anticipated that and we embraced it. We didn't want to try to harness it. We simply wanted to deploy it.